What I would like to do is just share some thoughts with you about ayahuasca and the ways in which it is viewed and the ways in which I think the scientific paradigm may be getting it wrong. So there's a lot of talk at this conference about what the sacred plants can do for us, heal our wounds, cure our addictions, expand our minds. We've been taught to think of the sacred plants as useful prepackaged collocations of active molecules. But in indigenous cultures, shamans heal because they're in a personal and mutual relationship with the healing spirits. When we use the sacred plants, our encounters with the world of the spirits are not visits to the therapist. Rather, they create a relationship that entails obligations as well. In this view, the sacred plants are autonomous others who are not means to our ends, but rather are ends in themselves, like vision fasts or dreams or talking circles Using these plants is a sacred shamanic ceremony which has its own often unforeseen purposes and lessons to teach us that we might not be expecting. So it's clear what we expect from the sacred plants. But in the midst of this conference, we might pause briefly and ask the shamanic question, what do the sacred plants expect from us? At the start of every ayahuasca ceremony, my maestro ayahuasquero, Don Roberto Acho, goes around the room putting agua de florida cologne in cross patterns on the forehead, chest, and back of each participant. As he does this, he blows smoke from the powerful tobacco called mapacho into the crown of the head and over the entire body of each participant and he whistles a special song of protection called an arcana. The song has no particular name, it is just la arcana and no words. It is a breathy whistle. And no words. It is intention abstracted from human language. The wordless whistling approximates instead to puro sonido, pure sound, which is the language of the plants. The goal is to cleanse and protect. The song calls the protective hanios, the thorny palm trees, the fierce animals, the predatory hawks and owls that are used in sorcery and thus best protect against it. The strong, sweet smells of cologne and tobacco attract the protective and the healing spirits, seal the body against attack, and avert the pathogenic projectiles, the darts, scorpions, monkey teeth, razor blades of the envious and the resentful. The goal, as Don Roberto puts it, is to erect a wall a thousand feet high and a thousand feet below the earth to protect himself, his students, and all who are in attendance. But why are there such protections, such precautions, at a ceremony that is, after all, intended for healing? Part of the answer is rooted in what I have called the tragic cosmovision of upper Amazonian shamanism where there are no bright lines between healing and sorcery, life and death, good and evil, predation and renewal. In this tragic cosmovision, the dark and the light, killing and curing, predator and prey are at once antagonistic and complementary. 
The price we pay for life is death, and out of death comes healing and life. The same plant and animal spirits, the same tools are used both to protect and to destroy. The shaman who knows how to heal is at the same time a sorcerer who knows how to kill. Once you drink ayahuasca, I was told, when you start to learn the plant teachers with your body, the world becomes a more dangerous place. Sorcerers resentful of your presumption will shoot magical pathogenic darts into your body or send fierce animals to attack you or fill your body with scorpions and razor blades, especially while you are still a beginner before you gain your full powers. Peruvian poet Cesar Calvo Soriano says that drinking ayahuasca makes one into a crystal exposed to all the spirits, to the evil ones and the true ones that inhabit the air. Such transparency is perilous. But again, in the upper Amazon, there is no bright line between the evil and the true spirits. Some of the most powerful of the plants, such as Katawa and Pukalupuna, want to deal only with the strongest and most self-controlled of humans, those willing to undertake long periods of solitude and fasting in the wilderness. Other humans, they kill. Now, we do not need ourselves to be embedded in the ambiguous and perilous shamanic culture of the upper Amazon to recognize the power of these beliefs as metaphor. What the protective ceremony is saying is this. You cannot be a tourist among the spirits. Shamans in the upper Amazon have established a relationship of trust and love with the healing and protective spirits of the plants. To win their love, to learn to sing to them in their own language, shamans must first show that they are strong and faithful, worthy of trust. To do this, they have to go into the wilderness, away from other people, and follow la dieta, the restricted diet. No salt, no sugar, no sex. And ingest the sacred plant that is the body of the spirit. That is the way the shaman learns the plant. Its uses, its preparation, its song. By taking the plant inside the body, letting the plant teach its mysteries, giving the self over to the power of the plant. There is a complex reciprocal interpersonal relationship between shaman and other than human person. Fear, awe, passion, surrender, friendship, love. Opening the door to the magical world is not a day trip. Every approach we make to the spirits entails reciprocal obligations, the risks and dangers of the vision fast. What those obligations are is a matter between each of us and the spirits, but at the very least they require gratitude and humility, a willingness to be courageous and vulnerable, to speak honestly from our hearts and listen devoutly with our hearts to tell the spirits our truest stories. Any encounter with the spirits is like a vision fast. How many people here have been on a vision fast? Wonderful. During a vision quest, we leave our ordinary life and comforts behind. We stay in solitude in the wilderness for four days and four nights without a tent, without food, without a fire. In this way, we express not only our willingness to undergo hardship for the sake of the spirits, but also our separation from our normal social relationships. 
the voluntary privations are part of our newly liminal condition to which, in which we encounter the dangerous unknown in order to bring back a gift, a song, a ceremony, our own unguessed talent, not for ourselves, but for our people. You cannot be a tourist on a vision fast. The same is true in any encounter with the spirits. The encounter is risky and meaningful. We have to be willing to undertake the dangerous opening of our hearts to tell our stories to the spirits with open-hearted honesty and to listen devoutly with our hearts to what the spirits tell us in return, often through the merest signs, the inchoate movements of our hearts, the silent singing of the plants. Any encounter with the spirits is like a talking circle. How many people here have been in a talking circle? We had kind of a talking circle last night, which was wonderful because people spoke open-heartedly and courageously. In a talking circle, people sit in a circle, pass around the talking stick. Whoever holds the talking stick gets to speak, and everybody else listens. There are no interruptions, no questions, no challenges. People speak one at a time, in turn, honestly from their hearts, and they listen devoutly with their hearts to each person who speaks. The effect, for those of you who have participated, can be miraculous. In many ways, the talking circle is the paradigmatic healing ceremony. The talking circle makes demands on us that we have a listening heart, that we have what St. Francis called a transformed and undefended heart. The talking circle demands that we put aside ego, speak our truth with humility, and open ourselves to the unspoken motions of the human heart. You cannot be a tourist in a talking circle. When people speak honestly and listen devoutly, what they, when they tell their stories, when they sing their songs to each other, healing occurs miraculously and spontaneously. Speaking our truths with humility in a circle touches upon something that is deeply and profoundly human. Communities become strong and relationships grow deeper on the basis of the songs and stories we sing and tell to each other and by our willingness to be transparent and vulnerable and accountable to each other. In a talking circle, we don't ask or demand that others in the circle help us or heal us or change us. We speak honestly from our hearts. We express our fears and hopes and regrets and we listen to the songs and stories of the others, opening up our hearts, becoming in a mysterious and sacred process, better people. Sitting in circle with others is itself the healing. Any encounter with the spirits is like a dream. How many people here have had a dream? <laughs> We're always strangers in the underworld of dreams. We are talked to in a language we do not speak. We are surprised at every turn by the exotic goods unloaded in the marketplace, the jokes we don't understand, the sudden kindness or treachery of our dream companions, our own capacity for compassion, terror, and rage. And perhaps like our own journeys, like our encounters with the spirits, like our vision fasts, dreams have a purpose to make us richer and more human. To that end, dreams are willing, perhaps like our own journeys, to teach us things that we do not always want to learn. You cannot be a tourist in your dreams. 
Any encounter with the spirits is mediated through the body. We tend to forget this. Throughout the upper Amazon, a shaman's power, the power both to heal and to harm, is conceptualized as a slimy or sticky substance, sometimes corrosive, which is kept in the shaman's chest or belly. Mestizo shamans call this substance simply la flema, phlegm, or jousa, the ordinary Quechua term for phlegm, or yachai, the Quechua word for knowledge, especially ritual or religious knowledge. It's in this phlegm that the shaman, whether a healer or a sorcerer, stores the magic darts that are used for both attack and defense. In the phlegm of the sorcerer are also toads, scorpions, snakes, insects, monkey teeth, razor blades, the biting, the stinging, and the venomous. What is striking about this is that shamanic power is a physical object inside the body capable of storage, projection, and transmit only five minutes? <laughs> the virtually universal method. <laughs> I'm just having so much fun. It just <laughs> went by so quickly. I'm trying. I'm trying to. <laughs> now I lost my place. <laughs> The virtually universal method of inflicting magical harm in the upper Amazon is to project the substance into the body of the victim, either the substance itself or the pathogenic projectiles the shaman keeps embedded within it. In the same way, to learn the secrets of a plant, what sicknesses it can heal, what song will summon it, what medicines it enters into, how it should be prepared, the shaman undergoes la dieta, living in solitude in the jungle without salt or sugar or sex, ingesting the plant, taking the plant into the body, learning its songs and secrets from within, and creating an intimate relationship. Amazonian shamans conceptualize this process as learning with the body. And in mestizo shamanism, where the patient, as well as the shaman, drinks ayahuasca, the effect is entirely mediated through a profound physicality. There is vomiting. There is the vile taste of ayahuasca. Um, there is diarrhea. From the first taste of ayahuasca in the ceremony, our relationship with the body is brought into sharp focus. We deliberately ingest something vile. We forcefully eject the contents of our bodies. The body is turned inside out. Its boundaries transgressed. We give up control of our bodies, hand ourselves over to the plant, and experience our embodiment in its most primal form. Our body becomes, in the word of literary theorist Mikhail Bakhtin, grotesque, fully embodied, porous and protuberant, part of the earth, exuberant and fecund. You cannot be a tourist in your own body. All of this makes us Westerners nervous. Two minutes. We distrust our bodies. We find vomiting wretched and miserable. We struggle to maintain our body boundaries. Above all, we seek ways to evade the ferocious physicality of the ayahuasca experience. We focus on visions, insight, transformative experiences. We seek in the words of psychologist James Hillman, an imageless white liberation, a flight from the reality of human embodiment. We secretly believe in what Bakhtin called the bodily canon, the belief that human beings somehow exist outside the hierarchy of the cosmos. 
What I think we are dealing with now has less to do with conceptual perceptions, has less to do with epiphanies, and has more to do with what Aristotle called eleos and phobos, pity and terror. And this, we should not be surprised to learn, links to the word in Greek, catharsis, or purging. The shaman works through the moral themes of healing discourse, not linearly, but in performance. The grotesque body, which is revealed in the ayahuasca ceremony, in fact celebrates the victory of life, its renewal and regeneration, true fearlessness in the face of our ineluctably human condition. Thank you. And I did that all in 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stefan. If you have any questions, please come up to the microphone. After listening to your uh, talk, I, I'm wondering if we should be looking forward to a future then where we go to clinics and sit down with psychiatrists and medical doctors and have them uh, uh, introduce us to ayahuasca, or do you have some different vision, like perhaps uh, shamans should be involved in such a thing? Um, I, I guess I'm not quite clear on what you're asking. Well, uh, uh, there's certain people uh, who would like us to move in the direction of clinics right. to deal with uh, psychoactive drugs right. uh, and to bring our money and lay it down and uh, uh, have a treatment that involves physicians and psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. uh, but you present a different possibility perhaps a, one where you could go to a group where it's run perhaps like they do down in, uh, uh, in Brazil uh, with a uh, shaman. Uh, and I would wonder, do you see any way that we could push for that rather than the other? Um, I'm not sure I would take a position that would recommend a, a, a one solution for everybody. Fine. I think there are, there are some some people who would flourish in a group in the jungle. There are some people who would flourish under other circumstances. I think the point I'm trying to, to make here um, is that when I think that scientists, um, neuropsychologists, psychopharmacologists, who are working with ayahuasca and other psychoactive substances need to be aware of the ways in which in its indigenous ceremonial context it works in terms of relationality, mutuality, and physicality. And I think that we as a culture spend a lot of time trying to move away from that and to try to have ayahuasca experiences that are induced by single active molecules without the profound physical effects where people purchase a cure without the demands of mutuality and reciprocity that the indigenous culture envisions for these kinds of healings. And I think that without taking these into effect, we may be creating something like a cargo cult, where in fact the, 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 the molecular effects are being abstracted from a larger context and for that reason may be less effective or may in fact produce unanticipated effects that are different from the ones that are being sought. So as I said, this is a, this is a set of suggestions that I'm, I'm putting out there. Yeah. yeah. Do you think ayahuasca could be taken in the future five, ten years like a medicine, like a pill <laughs> in the near future? Or there, no, it has to be already, always... 
people trying to market ayahuasca pills. Um, I, I think it's possible. I, I cannot predict whether there will indeed be continuing interest in ayahuasca in 10 years. All I know about Americans is that they have very, very short attention spans. Um, and I'm old enough to remember when Zen Buddhism was going to save the world. I remember when uh, LSD was going to save the world. I remember when rock and roll was going to save the world. And the world isn't saved yet. So I, I, I can't make predictions about what's going to happen with ayahuasca in the, in the next 10 years. All I know is that um, right now, in the greater culture, ayahuasca has become simply a trope for the edgy, the transgressive, the ultimately hip. And I think that whether that, in fact, is going to be the way in which our culture consumes and commodifies ayahuasca, I don't know. I see there are three people with questions. We have a little time left. Maybe you could, all three, um, ask your question, and then we ask Stefan to answer them together. Mm -hmm. um, when looking at traditional healing modalities, um, especially those dealing with psychoactive plant medicines, um, there seems to be this importance of um, familiarity and experience with the healers, personally. Um, and in trying to sort of readapt these medicines within a Western clinical standpoint, what is your stance on the importance of uh, clinicians having experience and understanding the experience themselves? Um, I, think, I think that um, projects such as those at New York University or Johns Hopkins or UCLA would benefit from having a knowledgeable anthropologist on the team. And I think that uh, there are lots of people who, who are knowledgeable about indigenous use of, of healing plants. And I think that input would be very helpful in, in trying to figure out the best way um, to experiment and the best way to come up with a way of producing the most effective possible medicine um, that will give you the results you're looking for. Hi. Um, I'm interested in hearing if you have any thoughts or ideas on how to produce or design or conduct a study into the more mutualistic or relationship between the shaman and the person drinking the ayahuasca um, and also through like dream interpretation or vision interpretation with the shaman. And is there any possibility um, to produce a measurable study of that effect? I, I have a bunch of ideas. <laughs> Um, I was just talking with um, uh, Catherine McLean this morning from Johns Hopkins, um, wondering the extent to which if somebody goes down to the Amazon and moves out of his or her comfort zone and encounters an entirely different environment, um, because a lot of the people who go down there have no wilderness experience. They may never have been in a, in a developing country before. There's a lot of things for them to get used to. And they may, in fact, um, even those who go down there for ecotourism without ayahuasca, may come back having had certain kinds of important personal discoveries that they have made about themselves because they have pushed the borders of their comfort zone in important and significant ways. I would like to see an experiment where, in fact, you have at least two groups, one of which goes down and does a, um, a difficult and, and ultimately successful, say, survival um, uh, training in the jungle and some who go down in the jungle and drink ayahuasca and do pre-tests and post-tests and see to what extent we can tease out the actual effects of um, the, the ayahuasca experience from other kinds of experiences that people may have in unfamiliar and challenging environments where, where they, they feel they have been able to overcome fear um, and, and achieve certain goals of personal significance. I have more. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk with you further about this because I'm looking into trying to produce some of these studies. Yes, 
The uh, paradigm once set by uh, Timothy Leary long ago um, of uh, the substance, the set, and the setting was more in relation mm -hmm. to LSD long ago. Uh, do you suggest kind of a different paradigm in relation to ayahuasca that has more of a focus on the uh, set and setting than does LSD? I think so. I think, I think expectation is a word that I would use that has a profound effect on people's reports of their ayahuasca experiences. I think that um, the ayahuasca community, that is, people here, um, people who attended the forum last night, have set up certain expectations about what ayahuasca experiences are supposed to be like. And um, my understanding, for whatever it's worth, is that these are very culture-bound and tied to our own culture and are very, very different from the understandings of what ayahuasca is, what it does, the nature of sickness and the nature of healing in the upper Amazon. And is it a surprise that the reports that gringos bring back are consistent not with the expectations of the people who live in the jungle, but with the expectations of their, per of their circle of friends and the, the ayahuasca community in which they are embedded? Um, if you go down to the, to the Amazon and you spend a lot of money to go down there and go to some retreat center. If you give up your two-week vacation, which is very valuable to you to go down there, and you are told that the effect of ayahuasca is a transformative experience, an epiphany, then are you surprised that people come back and report transformative experiences and epiphanies? And yet, in the, in, the, in the mestizo communities of the upper Amazon, very few people have any experiences of any value until they have drunk ayahuasca a number of times. My own plant teacher, uh, Doña Maria Tuesta, um, drank ayahuasca, and she was an experienced consumer of psychoactive substances drank ayahuasca three times before anything happened. Um, there are stories of coranderos who drank ayahuasca for months and did a diet for months and nothing happened. Um, but Americans are in a hurry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stefan. <laughs>